Hello, I'm here today with my colleague at Salem State University, Stephanie Young. She's in a professor of comparative literature in the English department and a senior research fellow at the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Salem State. Stephanie is also a friend of mine. Uh, we did our PhDs together and we've taken different paths, but also both work on very similar issues. Um, and so it's a real treat to have you here with me today, Stephanie. Thanks, Bridget. We are here today to talk about a new show, a photography show that opened at Bridge Gallery, which is in Cambridge, Mass. Um, and this show is one that Stephanie curated and I had a small part in consulting at various points in, in the progress of the show. It's called Disappearing Worlds, the photographs of Evgenia Arbugeva and Natalia Grigorashvili. Okay. Yes. So we're going to start out, Stephanie, I'd, ask to, I'd like to ask you to introduce our audience to these two photographers, um, what their work is, where they're from, and what they each do. Okay, great. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks for having me. Um, it's just great to chat about the show a little bit, um, because I would like to get as many people in here as possible who are interested in photography and we and contemporary photography. Um, this is a big deal for the Cambridge neighborhood and community to have such amazing photographers on the walls of um, Greg Krana's small gallery, Bridge Gallery. So we have two photographers um, who we felt like were both distinct in their own way, very strong images, but also are speaking to each other um, and having a conversation across the gallery from each other. And one of them, Evgenia Arbugaeva, she's um, a woman who's originally from the North Arctic Siberian Russia, if you want to say she was a Soviet baby. She was born during the USSR. Um, she had to leave her small Arctic town of Tixi when she was seven, about seven years old, because her parents, who were teachers, lost their jobs because the, of the dissolution of the USSR. They stopped receiving paychecks. So like many families in this small um, town, they packed up and moved to Yakutsk, which is the capital of Siberia and known as the coldest inhabited city in the world. And she lived out her youth there. Eventually she became a photographer. She studied at the ICP in New York and uh, living in New York, she felt like New York showed her what she wasn't. It was very challenging as a photographer and she was, just about feeling like she wanted to give up and decided that she would go back to Tixi and see it and see what had changed over all the years. And in 2010, she went back and she visited and there she met um, a young woman, um, very young girl actually, about her same age. And she befriended the family. I think they had some familial connection anyways from the old days and decided to do a show that was kind of her nostalgic longing of the past through the vision of images of this young girl. And so that's how she created uh, Tixie. Um, so do you want me to talk about Natala too right now or? Look at the two of them side by side and then we'll talk about how they might. Okay. Absolutely. So the other one, the second one, oh, and I should add that Jenny and now she's in her, you know, she's like in her mid thirties, just to kind of get a feeling for, you know, this is a younger photographer. This is someone who's working for National Geographic. She's very busy. And we'll, we can talk about other things uh, later about her. And the second one is Natala Grigalashvili. It's quite a mouthful for some people who don't speak Georgian. <laughs> and she does come from the former um, Republic of Georgia, which is the country of Georgia. Georgia, and I want to say it's a very distinctive place. It's not Russia, um, and they speak a different language, and there are a lot of subcultures also living in Georgia. And Natala is um, born and raised in, in a small village in Ajaria, which is in the southwest of Georgia. So she now lives in Tbilisi, and um, she had been under, she's also a Soviet baby, and under the USSR, she had been a journalist, and she had been given a Russian camera to use as a child, or an older child, let's say maybe teenager, and eventually she decided to get into photography and start doing her own projects. 
Um, she had been using journalism as a way to survive, but she also wanted to do something that felt closer to her heart. And she went back to Ajaria, to this region that she comes from, to take pictures of the villagers living there and what kind of lives they have. Ajaria is um, most famous for the, the city of Batumi, the beach town Batumi in there. But but in the mountains of Ajari, you have a culture of people who are living in what is regarded as an autonomous zone inside of Georgia and that have had, a, had quite a lot of, let's say, rebellious moments between the Georgian government and the Ajarian people who are predominantly Muslim. It's not because they are Muslim that these things were happening necessarily, but like everywhere in post-USSR, things are complicated. And but it's still a very beautiful region uh, with people who, unfortunately, a lot of them have had to leave and go to work seasonally in Turkey. And that's where you get this kind of nomadic idea. So you've got a lot of families who are Muslim. They go live in they work in Turkey in the season to earn money, come back to their villages. They might look to some people as if they're poor, but they're actually having it's just their style. It's the style of their way their life is. They're not necessarily um, desperately poor, but this is the way they live, very different than cosmopolitan places like Tbilisi, Georgia. So Natalie's um, a series here about Georgian nomads. She took over a long period of time. She likes to live there. She likes to stay with the people. She likes to really take her time, take her time and get to know the people before she starts photographing them. So that's the other side of the wall here. Yeah. So you titled this this show disappearing worlds so what did you what does that that phrase mean to you and which is another way of saying what do we see by seeing these two the works of these two women together i mean that's a huge question bridget as you know <laughs> um and it's hard to answer except for i could say in um kind of more universal or bigger way it's the idea of well worlds that no longer exist and how do you or worlds that are starting to not exist anymore and how do you capture those as a photographer and do diligent with due diligence and to show people your message if you're taking pictures of your arctic childhood that no longer exists and you go back to the arctic and take pictures of a place that's also still disappearing and now because of global warming because of not necessarily because because of war or because of right these kinds of ideas, that's a disappearing world in its own right. Natalas is these people in Ajaria are um, a very small culture living in Georgia. And we know that um, these cultures are dying out all over the world in this sense, that we don't have as many people living this kind of life anymore, um, making their own butter and et cetera, the things you will see in the pictures if you come to the show. Um, in the in another sense, um, I think this idea is, is what's the unconscious um, of each photographer? You know, how are they trying to grapple with the disappearance of themselves in the world, of what they were, their memories in the world? How do they maintain or hold on to memories when the structure that they lived in as children is disappearing? And what does that mean for them? What is what kind of worlds are disappearing for them. And there are many layers of disappearances, I feel like, but also I feel like the title is just very generic in a way. I mean, I um, because it could apply to so many different ideas of disappearing. And that's great because when people have come to the gallery, they start thinking on their own of, well, what's disappearing in my world? Or what do I think a disappearing world is? And so it, even if it's, I feel like maybe it's not, directly related to the photographs in here, there are these connections that lots of viewers are making to the title and to the images of which they know, you know, they don't know these places, right? Most of them don't know these places. So that, I like that part. One of the things that I think is really interesting about that title, um, and we talked a little bit about various titles um, in development, but I really like the one that you settled on because because like you said, I mean, a photograph is always about time. I mean just by its mm -hmm. nature, by capturing that sliver. Um, but you're talking about this disappearing Soviet world, right? That is still relevant. I think disappearing means it's still there, it's not gone, which is is very interesting in a world that tends to forget history so quickly, especially, um, maybe especially in the United States when we look at places 
from afar. We're like, okay, what's next? Like that was forever ago. We're not taught about that and we don't teach much about it in, the, in our schools. But then also this kind of future projection that they each have about a world that will no longer be. Um, mm -hmm. It's like you're mourning the future before it arrives, right? So you're you're thinking, I want to hold on to things because I can't foretell the future exactly, but I feel like these are things that we won't have and we need to see them. We need to take pictures of them. We need to archive them for the future. We need to show people what, you know, what's disappearing no matter, you know, slowly in the world or maybe quickly now when it comes to like Arctic ice, for example. I think it also, it really captures a political and social mood right now as well as this sense of lots of things are changing. There's lots of sort of global factors, but there's also political factors in terms of like a sense of slippage and democratic principles, uh, a slippage in the institutions that used to hold. Um, and the photographs to me, because they're also very human centered, but across these huge landscapes, really push us to think like, how are human lives, individual ones, you can kind of see the one of the boy standing in the foreground with his family, mm -hmm. exactly. How are these playing out? What will hold them into the future? Um, so that, that complex, that sort of interwoven sort of collapsing on itself sense of time, but also, um, the lives that are at the center of these uncertainties. Um, yeah, and I think that it shows the different layers of each country, let's say. I mean, Russia, we know it's huge and there's so many different kinds of Russias. And I think with um, this war going on right now in Ukraine, there's a sense to vilify every single Russian idea, person, thing, place, but we need to be more subtle than that. We need to think about these things on, you know, more, we, I need to, and everyone, and everyone, I feel like needs to think about this a little bit more um, about difference in Russia, and also the Georgians. I mean, the Georgians were under Russian occupation for so long uh, that people believe that Georgians, their native language is Russian, and I have, and there are a lot of people who might think that Georgians speak. Russian and then George they weren't aware of a Georgian language necessarily unless they visited or had close contact with Georgians so I think the show is also kind of the idea is to open up these spaces for people so that they can start thinking about these ideas even more you know what are these different worlds that are within these countries who what are these cultures what should we know about them and this is just one you know these are just a few pictures, right? Just a slice of the information that's out there. But they also share, I mean, com we were kind of talking about like, what do they have in common, you know, before we got online, before we got kind of online. <laughs> so, but I mean, you've got two Soviet babies, you know, um, who are trying to like express this post-Soviet world um, in different, very, very different ways, you know? And also it shows this diversity of, what was the USSR, you know, what did it occupy and what are those people doing now? And, uh, you know, how, how are they coming out of it even uh, decades later? Yeah. Yeah. And what I like about both of them is even like, I mean, I think I said this before, but just to, to hit it a second time is you, they capture all that complexity and all these layers but very sort of human centric. The human is very central, but also not controlling the environment. Um, especially, um, you know, if you look at Arbugeva's work against this, this Arctic background, the humans are front and center in her images, but clearly not mastering their landscape. I think that's also a theme that that rises across both of the... Um... Yeah, I think that's important, Bridget. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because in Arbugaiva, there are uh, people in most of the images that we have here in the in the gallery, but they're kind of sometimes they're 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 dwarfed, you mm -hmm. know, in the sense that they're there and they're important and they're central in the stories of the images, but they're also dwarfed by this kind of bigger Arctic look, right, which gives them a very almost sometimes surreal or magically real sense. Um, when you look at them. And then Natalas, for instance, um, the boy on his first day of school, which is above my shoulder here, or the man reading to the children who, the Muslim 
Muslim children. These are just so humanistic. And when people came into the gallery, um, it was really wonderful to see people's deep connections just in the humanistic kind of um, level with um, a lot of the images in here. Yeah, I mean, you did a wonderful job selecting both the photographer also the specific images. Um, and I'll just note that the show will be up at Bridge Gallery in Cambridge until October 14th. Yes. Um, one final question. Do you, are there plans in the works to continue with this idea or to continue your collaboration with Greg Crana, who is, um, who is the owner and obviously played an enormous role as well in creating this exhibit? Yeah, Greg, I mean, Greg is always having um, different kinds of exhibits. And in fact, um, last year he had the Finnish photographer, Penti Shamalati, who uh, Bridget and I both, we, I mean, we both loved um, Penti's work. We were just amazed by it, the black and white photographs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so the plans, it depends on who wants to be involved, um, but there are uh, plans to have another Disappearing World show if you know, if the cards, if everything comes together, it depends on, we received a grant from Cambridge City, which I should mention here, um, to put this show on. Um, Greg spent met so much time. He hand built all the frames. He painted the gallery and he did an amazing amount of work to make this show look beautiful. And his aesthetics are just so on, right? He's just so good at that. Um, has such a good eye as well. And is such a great collaborator. So we're hoping that um, we can do it one more time if everything hap you know goes our way. So <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Stephanie, thank you for taking the time to speak with me and for bringing all your knowledge to the show, which I, again, is just, it's such a moving and beautifully constructed um, exhibit. So thank you. Thanks a lot, Bridget. I really appreciate it.